with mostly Western rosters now solidifying their lineups and switching less and less players, I thought it was a good time to revisit a concept I've initially observed in March 2017, when I saw a principle of team building that was present in every single premier and major tournament winner up until this point. And that principle was the core of four. So the core of four is an observation of at least four players, sometimes five players sticking around with each other for at least three months on the low end, but most of the time, sort of, I would say almost half a year until they won their first tournament and also perform peak performances. Now to mention a couple of examples so you understand the concept more in practice. I guess the most obvious one would be Lunatic High that after season one had to shed two members in Detajan and Dean and brought in Zumba as well as Who Are You? And without skipping a beat that lineup was able to incorporate these members into their play and already won Apex Season 2. Then once again they had to lose Lee Chi Jun for Season 3, meaning they had to rebuild a roster of previously six champions, but kept the core around and therefore were able to build once again upon that core of Eska, Toby, Roger Hong and Miro, which again won Season 3. Uh, albeit with some hiccups, but that's the Lunatic Highway in general. They never really dominated from the beginning of any Apex season that they won. Another good example would be the initial Rogue Core that looked like to be AKM wins Nox and Anko. And after losing Tivik, and IDDQD. They that roster once again brought in new talent with Nico and Soon and was able to once again win tournaments. And that was also a, a pretty practical explanation as to why they won the shuffle because they kept their core around and then shuffled two members out while the Misfits roster wasn't the actual Misfits core that had won the Overwatch Open, but had to incorporate not only two members, but more. So that seemed to validate that principle. And we have seen a lot of instances of this being true. For instance, the old Immortals core sticking around for a long time, the Immortal Brotherhood, and winning a couple of tournaments while both Rogue and Envious were in Korea. They were built on a strong bond and social components, which we get to later, where I explain why I think the core four works. But obviously, we could talk about the IDDQD core. So that, that's not about the player, that's about the initial roster of um, Internet Hulk's great team building efforts. So I would describe the IDDQD core as Internet Hulk, Chips Iron, Coco, and obviously Harry Hook. They played with each other for a while, then brought Chaimu back in. And once Internet Hulk was sort of forced out of that core group, it became a core focused around Taimu. And that's also a very important feature, of course, is that they are able to transition. So this happens very often that a core of four would shed one member, take in a new one, and that would then become part of the core eventually, which again takes time to build up and the performance of the, those teams dip for a while, but then sort of create a new archetype, especially if, if you have very strong personalities or very, very specific play style personalities in your core that requires you to change your core's archetype in how they play. And that was definitely the case for IDDQD when Taimu became a more focal point of shot calling when it had previously been on Internet Talk. If you look at the sound recordings of some of the tournaments where you had access to the voice 
or the comms, it was quite obvious that, at least in the ones I've seen, um, Internet Hulk was basically doing all the macro strategy for them. And once you lose them, this spot needs to be filled somehow. And Envious after that dipped for a little bit and eventually recovered. Though, to be fair, I guess they've never achieved a win as impressive as this Apex Season 1 victory after they lost Internet Hulk um, in the process. So, let's get to why I think this is a a component and why or what the reasons for a call for it would be. Now, obviously, Overwatch is a very, very confusing and complex game. So, in order to find synergy with players, you need to play with them for a while. And let's focus on the gameplay aspect. So, there are obviously some unspoken things that happen where, for instance, you see your support move in a specific way or approach a certain angle and you immediately know what you have to do and it's you don't really need to talk as much and that stuff needs to develop over a longer period of time um, certainly a very big component is obviously communication and that was recently pointed out to me by an overwatch league player that i found quite interesting because his team had inflicted upon the core of four and they realized that in their comms, nobody was actually asking how the ultimate status was. So, unbeknownst to them, a component of the core of four was taken out. And, okay, they knew that part, but they didn't know what that specific player was bringing to the comms. They never had mapped out what the responsibilities of that specific player were. So, when it came to game day, it suddenly seemed like what's going on like there's something missing in our communication and that's also very interesting about the core four that it seems almost ineffable for teams to say what that special quality is at the same time i talked to many coaches and players within these cores and they could definitely tell me in every single notable or championship winning core who these four players were even if they stuck around as six players. So most of the time, the core members would have a good connection, have good playability among each other. They would likely not be on a position that flanks a lot because you don't need to coordinate that much unless that's your play style. In fact, most of the time, play Tracer players seem fairly plug and play on most rosters because they don't need to communicate as much or get just get told what to do by their main tank, who most of the time, for instance, in the case of Jester and Prophet, seem to have, or this seems to be one of the most important synergies in Overwatch at the moment, is the, the especially in dive combinations, the Tracer or the Flanker in general with their main tank. But yeah, they could point out to me four players that sort of stood out and coordinated the group. Now, why would it be four? Well, I tried to skim my local library for any soci sociological explanations or even evolutionary ones. If you have any input on that, once again, last time I asked for explanations that really helped me out in my research. Maybe, maybe I'm lucky this time again and someone knows more about this. But it seems to me also in other games where you don't have six plays but four, uh, five, that still the core of four seems to man be maintained in many of these all-time great rosters outside of Overwatch. So that is, for instance, true for CSGO, where obviously one of the, or possibly the best um, team in the world at the moment, SK Gaming, only ever sheds one member, but the core now of four players have found each other. So maybe there's more to it than just for Overwatch, but maybe there's a sociological or biological explanation while groups of four work the best together. I can only muse on the reasons why. I mean, for once in Overwatch, four players is a majority, so you are always going to overrule the other two in terms of uh, decisions making also outside of the game if your 
course on the same page you also provide structure for these two other players that just have to slot into this and it becomes fairly plug and play in many situations then. It is also interesting that four players, if they have quibbles among each other, don't have a necessarily deciding voice unless three are against one because two against two is not a majority. So in those situations, they need to figure it out amongst themselves, which might improve decisions making or just truth finding formulas. But yeah, this this is a very interesting observation. And if you know anything about this, I'd love to hear that and back it up with um, literature. And okay, so let's move to the modern applications and what that could actually mean for the Overwatch League and how Overwatch is perceived and especially how team building will work in the future. So we've recently had the two boss, uh, the two <laughs> sort of spoiled, the two Western lineups, Boston Philly win against the Korean perceived overlords. And mm, a little bit of it might also be towards, at least in the NYXL case, where they obviously put a lot of eggs in the basket of winning against Seoul and therefore didn't practice as much against uh, Boston. But I don't want to take anything away from Boston. It just seems to be the reality of the situation. If the, you look at the level of play of NYXL against Seoul, that was another level, surely. And which is most of the time based on preparation. So still, these two rosters seem to have, even though they weren't necessarily built on a core, though you could argue that Philly had three members and that maybe was a transition core from the old face lineup, how did they manage to create that synergy somehow? Now, obviously, one aspect that I have to completely concede is that it's very possible that the core of four was only necessary before the Overwatch League started, because there, there wasn't as much coaching structure. There weren't actually guys that could figure out these special components of the core and could tell you what you need to focus on as much. You were all on your own for the most part because there was at most maybe one coach that still, I mean, talk to players. They they, are, they don't high, hold their coaches, it's at least pre-Overwatch League, in the highest regards. So these guys most of the time were just glorified um, scrim schedulers. But it is. it seems very possible that because of bigger coaching staffs and whatever, and also probably accessibility of the team's comms, that these teams, especially Boston and Philly, have figured out what it is to build this special foundation. And let's not forget, they've also been around each other for a long period of time now, which al already gets into the zone where I, which I described, which is between three months and half a year. If we think of um, the roster window closing, I believe it was, I think it closed the last day of October, if I'm not mistaken. That would make it now three months where these teams have played with each other. And we can assume that they are still not peaking in their ability. Now, both, both Boston and Philly have accepted or mostly played around that core of four. They mostly field four of the same players. And it would be fairly easy to point out who these players are. Um, it's interesting in Philly's case that they probably are now currently working around a tank that they maybe didn't want to be the only tank, but had to now because of the Seto situation. And they were seemingly able now to work around this very aggressive tank player, which is Fraggy, and to sort of also maybe a little bit assisted by the Mercy meta to work with a formula around that core. And obviously very important in that team is obviously the synergy of, the bo of both DPS players who seem to be on the same page very often and that sort of enhances their ability to play with each other. But yes, these, these two Rosses have now stuck to their guns. So then surely teams that don't adhere to the core four would find to be less accessible. And as a s proof of concept, 
I think one could point to the last series of London Spitfire against the Boston Uprising. So the Boston Uprising, a team that adheres to the core four, and London Spitfire, a team that has played four of the same men members across that series, but probably hasn't located the actual members of their core four. So across the series, Bedosan, Fury, Jesha, Nuss played all the maps, and then they switched out the DPS and had all of the, their four DPS players play, which was Prophet, Birdring, Hurek, and Rascal. Now, they won their first map, I would say barely, with the lineup of, let me look this up real quick, Hurek and Birdring. And this was mostly, I, I would say it was mostly a composition win, and also certain members just staying out and clutching it out on individual performances, much more so than it was about a team win. Then they go to Temple of Anubis and switch in Rascal, and they completely bomb out. They go to Ilios, and Hurek is once again, and now he, he is playing Widowmaker, and nothing's working. They go to Junkertown, and now they bring in Prophet. Now, why I think that Prophet is part of that core for principle for them is because he has formidable synergy with Jesha, possibly the best tank DPS synergy in the league. And that has been true for a long time. I remember sitting with other analysts in in Discord and just talking about how these two players, especially in the Apex season run, could make every dry run dangerous. It actually meant, like, if they were dry running, with, they were just not losing loop. They were forcing all the best support players to use their ultimates, and they would at times still die. Now, they tried this out in preseason to run the old GC Busan roster, and for whatever reason, it might be coaching staff, it might be acclimation to a new environment, it could be a lot of factors that didn't seem to work out. Now, I don't like the complete abandonment of the GC Busan core, but if you have to, and if you want to build a better roster about, around them, and you think you have better alternatives, and I probably... So if we think about individually, Bedosan has looked like, at least in talent levels, to be better than Hagopion, even though his ultimate usage is actually even worse than Jonax. And if you look at the last maps of... Um, especially Junkertown, he was basically lottery uh, hitting Q. In terms of individual performance on the main support role, you have Closer versus Nuss. So Closer was the GC Busan shot caller as well as main support. And Nuss came in, wasn't actually part of KDP, but came from Meta Athena. On Meta Athena, Nuss looked terrible in terms of individual performance. Was one of the reasons they weren't doing as well. But I've heard a lot of very good things about his shot calling. So, especially in the Mercy meta, and we don't know what Closer looks like on Mercy, I think you can sort of swallow that individual downgrade and keep a good shot caller around, which then again still means you need to reassemble your core. So in general, long story short, in order to build some consistency, into that London Spitfire roster, I personally would go with a core of Gesture, of Prophet, of Nuss, and of Bedosin, and would then possibly also always play Fury because he seems to be very, very good. Not sure how he how much he communicates in that roster. But that unfortunately only means that you only ever have one DPS flex spot. And it's unfortunate that three, possibly three of the best DPS players, so maybe in the top 20 they would all be present, that these players have to fight for one spot among three of them. But that's simply the case of how that synergy between them shakes out for me, especially because Prophet has also been performing extremely well on all of his picks. Um, he has a very good Junkrat, he has a get very good Genji, and he has a very good Tracer, and if you can build around that, that's already a very solid foundation in your lineup. That's how I, with of Core 4 in mind, would build around that roster, and obviously maybe that principle might become less and less 
significant for teams that already have coaching staff that allocate a lot of those resources or have understood what it is all about it. But even even though those rosters that seem to have very strong coaching staff seem to be convinced of the core of four and mostly stick to them. So as a last implication of the core four, this also obviously tells us a lot about team building in the future, especially for the new franchises that come in, and potentially also for the franchises that are currently doing very, very badly in the Overwatch League. So, for instance, a Shanghai Dragons would have probably, with four slots left, had tremendously benefited if they could have brought in the core of the Great Miraculous Langstus core, which apparently isn't possible for different reasons of age and boosting. It could m mean a lot of help for Florida, even though I think there is still a very successful core in there. And if you can augment and not pull apart these players, because it's also the, a, a little bit of a problem that not only is are the players stretched to the maximum of their hero pools and can't really only one track these um roles anymore but they need to stretch out their practice and therefore devalue also their individual performances but it's also that they don't have the coaching staff so while they are forced to adhere to the core four they also don't have the sort of augmentation principle of the core so they can't bring in two new members every map depending on how you want to play or how you need to play in fact so bringing in at least two players and i'm not sure who these four players would be on uh on florida because we haven't seen them really play with other players it's very hard without team comms or talking to players to sort of um assert who that core four is within that team but that could certainly help but the biggest part for me and it, that is also a huge opportunity for contenders teams especially the korean ones is for the new franchises that might enter the Overwatch League for Season 2 who need to build entire new rosters. And for me, every single smart team-building effort needs to start with the best possible core available. Which is why I thought it was always a crime that Teams 4 went the Rogue core back in the day, when that core had been proven to be excellent, and it doesn't matter what happened directly in front of the Overwatch League, especially because uh, with those circumstances. So, I think what new franchises should be doing is to look at contenders and see which of those rosters, and that's that's the beauty of the core for principle, because you don't need to build those cores yourself. You just have natural selection of tournaments, especially in these round robin tournaments in contenders, figure out who the best cores are, and then you just get four of them and start building your team from there. So without having seen much, obviously one of the big um, opportunities currently would be the X6 core or the Element Mystic core, even though now they seem to be ripped apart, which I personally, especially in the role of a main team, don't like as much. I think... In most cases, the expected value of ripping someone out of his core is not to have him play at the same level again. Because synergetic values always value the individual player higher because he plays better in that core of four principle. So if someone was to bring in someone from Element Mystic, I would talk to the coaches and bring maybe the coach as well as at least four of these members along in order to build a solid foundation. Then all the contenders teams also from the Western regions would have a chance. So obviously one of the so most solid cores at the moment is the core of Houston. And in terms of the core of Houston, I would say obviously they've brought in five members. It is quite apparent to me that Clockwork was never part of that core principle. Um, he wasn't shot calling or anything. So the, the core even though they have violated it quite a lot of times, but they also had enough time to augment the core or transition the core from core three to, to a new core four, um, is obviously Muma and uh, Kulmat. That's their basic foundation. But then also 
um, either of the supports. Most of the time, currently, I believe Banny is playing, but that is mostly because of the current meta requirements. But then they've... Linkser, I'm not sure. We, we, we would have to look at the specific situations, but it seems more to me that long-term, just from the personality Jake is, he will be part of that core and will integrate, and then he's a staple member, and obviously, yes, maybe you, you just only ever switch one member out um, on specific maps, because Lynx is just playing too well as a um, as an individual player to not build on him. I'm not sure how the synergy lies with him, how much he shot calls. Maybe he is rather the core member. It looks to be this, this way at the moment, because uh, the performance only ever seems to drop from that team when Lynx is missing, so maybe we have something to say about this uh, this component here. Though, obviously, you have to weigh, is it that he's part of the core for, or is it just that he's so individually great that he's elevating that level of play, when it would have to examine that once again. So, just to finish the train of thought, there are opportunities for Western very great cores to just be brought along at least four or three members of that core and to have that as a foundation for a uh, possibly or most most likely a western organization to be the foundation of so and then to build around and then maybe bring koreans and whatever but once you have that foundation once contenders has developed that for you and has found via natural selection the best candidates of course then you build up on that and i i think that should also be the function of contenders to develop cores and then also sometimes develop the individual players that can be slotted onto these cores. Now one thing I did fail in in this video was to one-shot it and I uh, apologize for that. There's a lot of boring here in, in my house and it's not really pleasant when I record that and it's in the background, it's louder than my voice, so I had to cut a couple of times here. But other than that, maybe you could weave on the principle of the core four where you find it where it isn't as accurate anymore maybe the core four will be obsolete down the line because of coaching structure that knows what a core four is made of and can slot in these things but as a principle at least pre overwatch league and the, in the early stages of the overwatch league which we are part of now i don't think it's deniable that this is the case thanks for watching